And people will say, well, there is, and you've heard it today, there's not that much physical metal out there. There isn't, there isn't. But in the physical market, as the market uses that term, there is much more metal than that. There's a hundred times what there is. Precious metals are financial assets, and like currencies and T-bills and T-bonds, they trade in the multiples of a hundred times the underlying physical. They trade in the multiples of a hundred times the underlying physical. Silver, the most undervalued metal in human history. Gold today is without a doubt more rare than silver. But what about tomorrow? On average today, for every 10 ounces of silver pulled out of the ground, only one ounce of gold is mined. However, the majority of silver mined is used for consumption, while the majority of gold mined is nearly all added to global inventory. Yet precious metal investors, as small of a group as they are, are still investing $7 in GLD for every $1 they invest in SLB. Looking at modern history, silver is destined to be more rare and certainly worth more than gold. In 1950, there were 10 billion ounces of above ground available silver. By 1980, it shrank to 3.5 billion ounces. And in 2010, it is estimated that above ground available silver supply is between 500 to 700 million ounces. To put this into perspective, total above ground available gold in 1950 was 1 billion ounces and today it's estimated to be around 7 billion ounces. In 1980 when silver nearly reached $50 per ounce, global population was 2.5 billion people. Global GDP was $10 trillion and China had the 11th largest economy. Today, global population is near 7 billion people. Global GDP, $60 trillion. And China is now the second largest economy. So the population since 1980 is up 176%. Global GDP is up 500%. Above ground available gold is up 600%. Meanwhile, above ground available silver has plummeted at least by 91%, and the price is still down 46% from its 1980 high of $50 per ounce. To say the opportunity in silver is enormous is an understatement. Looking at the historical silver to gold ratio of 15 to 1, silver is highly undervalued today. It now takes 50 ounces of silver to purchase one ounce of gold. Even when ignoring the above ground supply deviation, mined metal production should at the very least bring that number to 10 to 1. Using today's prices with gold at 1400 silver should be worth no less than $140 per ounce. Silver is being consumed more than ever, and it is a fact that there is less above ground available silver than there is gold. Industrial demand for silver is up 18% in just the last year. The need for silver is growing by the day. Silver is being consumed and used for bandages for wound care, batteries, brazing, soldering, Cadillac converters, cell phones, computers, satellites, high-tech weaponry, lasers, digital technology, clothing, electronic circuit boards, ink, solar cells, water purification, wood treatment, antennas, RFID chips, freeway toll transponders, passports, and the list goes on. From 1990 to 2000, nearly 2 billion ounces of above ground available silver disappeared to consumption. Yet industrial demand for silver was only 35% by the year 2000. Today it's 54%. And looking at the new uses for silver, the silver production deficit will only widen. China since 2003 has been growing its solar energy base by almost 100% every year. By 2014, the world will need 130 million ounces of silver just to satisfy one year of global solar demand. The world has consumed so much silver in the last 50 years that the last time above ground available inventory was this low was 1300 AD. The deficit of silver production has been met mostly from government stockpiles. 
the U.S. has dumped nearly 5 billion ounces since World War II into the silver markets. But as of 2010, according to the USGS, the government stockpile for silver are listed as none. The supply and demand deficit continues to be ignored by global investors year after year, decade after decade. Total mining production for 2009 was 710 million ounces. Total demand was 889 million ounces. That's a mining production deficit of 179 million ounces to meet demand. With each day comes a new use for silver, and the supply and demand deficit continues to eat away at the above ground available supply. FutureMoneyTrends.com is projecting that just as palladium was once worth more than platinum, silver will one day be worth more than gold. The demand for silver will continue to increase, yet mining production will never be able to keep up. Depleting the above ground available silver supply possibly by the end of this decade, silver may be the greatest investment in human history. How often does not any generation get the opportunity to invest in a finite resource that will soon be extinct? Good evening again. Did you pick up some more silver? Yes, I did. The price dropped to $28, so I decided to back up the truck. Smashing. It may not be long before the price goes to $50 or higher, considering how much of it is being unmined every year. Unmined? What do you mean by that? Let me ask you a question. Do you know what mining is? Well, yes, I think so. Mining is the act of gathering metal from below the ground. Okay. And can you just go out to your backyard and mine gold or silver? Well, no. You have to find a mine first. And why is a mine better than your backyard? Because mines are where concentrated supplies of metal ore have been found in sufficient quantities to allow for profitable mining operations. I see. So successful mining has two requirements. A concentrated supply of ore, and a large amount of earth to be dug up? Correct. So what do you suppose in and mining would be? I guess it would be the opposite of mining. And would you describe that? And mining would be the burying of a metal in unconcentrated amounts. Correct. Do you know how much gold is mined every year? I believe around 50 million ounces. Correct. And how much gold is unmined every year? Well, unless it gets buried and lost which is unlikely because it is so valuable, I would say zero. Correct. And how much silver is mined every year? I believe around 700 million ounces. Close enough. And how much is being in mined every year? How would I determine that? Well, do you know how much is used every year for high-tech industry? I believe high-tech industry uses around 500 million ounces every year. And what happens to that silver? It is used in tiny amounts in every electronic device. And what happens to those devices? Well, I suppose after they break, they are thrown away and dumped into landfills. And are those landfills all located together? No. They are scattered all over the world. And do they recover any of that silver before they dump those devices into landfills? No. Why not? Because the amount of silver per device is so tiny, and the price of silver is so low, it is not worth the effort. So what you are telling me is, that roughly 500 million ounces of silver is used every year in tiny amounts for high-tech gadgets? Yes. And when those gadgets break, they are tossed out as rubbish and the silver in them is lost? Yes. And that silver is not recycled, because it is too difficult, and the price of silver is too low? Yes. And therefore it ends up being buried all over the world in unrecoverable amounts? Correct. So could you not say that all of that silver is being unmined? Yes. You could. So every year, that the world mines 50 million ounces of gold, it also unmines 500 million ounces of silver? Yes. 
So for every one ounce of gold being preserved, 10 ounces of silver are destroyed? Yes. And how much longer do you think that can go on? I don't know. But for it to stop, the price of silver must go much, much higher. And if it doesn't, then there won't be any silver left at all. Okay. So then what are you going to do about it? I am going to run, not walk, down to the coin store and buy as much physical silver as I can afford. Excellent. Goodbye. David, welcome back to House Street. Well, thanks for having me, Tom. Last week you had a headline story that had us going about the change of the silver market, and, and now come some, some changes that I'd like to throw along your way and see what you say. Uh, the Financial Times... So a disturbing new trend has come up that uh, hedge fund and other investors are increasingly seeking to invest in physical commodities themselves, the silver and gold, rather than in futures. What's your thoughts on that development? Well, I think it's significant, and it could become more significant. Basically, a little history, and most of our listeners probably already know this, but there was a very large position held by a hedge fund in the GLD, the uh, ETF for mm-hmm. gold, one of the one of them, one of the bigger ones, and I don't know what influenced them, but we'll just say that um, some of the more known writers <clears throat> in the sector, probably I'm going to guess Jim Poplava is one for Financial Sense, probably some of the writers on HowStreet.com, perhaps myself, whatever. This gentleman kind of had a wake up call and said, you know what, <clears throat> I'm selling my multi billion dollar position in the GLD, and I'm moving it into physical gold. Mm. That was sort of, I think, the first one out of the gate, so to speak. That means that, you know, others that follow this guy who's had a very good track record and he's into gold is changing the type of gold ownership that he has from an ETF type of gold holding to a physical holding. Why? Well, I, I can't speak for the man, but for myself, it's very easy. The ETF is fine if you're a trader, only you only want price exposure. But one is within the system. And one of the reasons that you want gold and silver is they're the only asset classes outside of the system if you hold them properly. And properly means that you hold them in physical form and you have them stored properly, and now they are outside of the system, which means that if there was a banking problem, for an example, or a trading problem on a futures exchange or with the ETF, or a stock market hiccup, or a trading halt, or any things that are possibilities, doesn't matter to you. You could walk over to your safe deposit box, pull out your gold or silver, and you know go make a transaction if that was the case. Not that you would, but you could. In mm-hmm. other words, it's protected outside of the mainstream financial system, and that's what I stress. So certainly, if you have that portion of your portfolio covered already, and you want to hedge your position or get added exposure and use the ETF to do so, I really don't have a big problem with that. Mm-hmm. But when you consider the ETF to be your, or any paper, gold, or silver product, or precious metals product, to be your primary holding, in other words, you believe that because you have exposure through the stock market for a precious metals investment or an oil investment or some natural resource, and that is your protection, you better rethink it. Because if everybody's thinking the same, nobody's thinking very much. What you have to understand is really you're still exposed to the system, and that's what you're trying to avoid. Hmm. This is, uh, just let me play devil's advocate. Okay, we know that China has, and Japan have got around well, $2 trillion in U.S. denominated funds. We've got the Arab states, $2 trillion, give or take. So all of a sudden they decide to buy, say, all the silver and copper above ground. And instead of deploying it and making cell phones or shipping it off to get it smelting in America and turn it into a building, uh, whatever, they sit on it because the shortage has raised the price. So then what follows? Well, it's a scenario that, you know, possible, obviously, and, uh, and I'll give you a story, and it's a true one. I won't mention any names, but I have a very good friend in Canada that does a great deal of consulting with uh, fund managers. Mm-hmm. And some of these guys wield some pretty you know, capable amounts of money, not as large as we're talking here. But big. But big. And so he called me, and this was about two years ago, actually, and he said, you know what, they're looking for some really good ideas. Do you have any ideas? And, you know, I kind of, I didn't really think it through because of the number of, you know, dollars that he gave me. Um, and I said, well, sure, why don't you um, 
set up some kind of a silver bank and, you know, buy physical bullion and store it. And he started chuckling and he says, okay, we just did that. We bought up all the remaining silver in the world. Now we have 90% of our funds left. Now what do we do? Wow. So that, I think, is a very important question that you asked, Tom, because, you know, and that's, a, that's the truth. I mean, you know, you can take it or leave it. But it's, it is wow. factual, and it kind of, you know, put me back on my heels from the aspect of, yeah, you know, I've always known the silver market is small, and, of course, I knew what it was worth at that time. It just kind of blew by me because certainly silver is – a very good asset class, and it's it's comparable to gold in many ways, yeah. but it's a very small market. So anyone that's of that caliber of that kind of money to move in the silver market, will it move the price higher? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It'd send it to the moon. But they can't get enough exposure to it to really do them any good, if you follow what I'm saying. I, I got you. International banks and nation states like China can move into gold because the gold market is still big enough it's a small market relative to the stock market or the bond market or the debt markets by far, but still it's big enough that you can get some exposure for protection. But if you wanted to get protection and just use silver as that one entity, hmm. for any large size capital like we're speaking about, it's impossible. It can't really be done. Hmm. That's like Warren Buffett. When Buffett bought 20% of the above ground uh, supply of silver in 1999 and announced it in 2000, he did it in the commodities market because he could only get that kind of exposure through the silver itself. Now, I don't mean to contradict myself. I'm going to make the point here. Because he couldn't have gone into any stock. He couldn't have gone into Pan American or Silver Standard or Western Silver, any of those, because those market caps were so tiny that he would have sent them to the moon. The only way he could get silver exposure was to go into the physical market and at that not buy like all of it, because it would send the thing to the moon. He just slowly over time accumulated his position, and then he announced it. That can't even be done anymore. There's not that much silver left anymore, in the, at least for my work. And Precious metals have been the front-page story here in Canada every day, which is no surprise to you, because, as you know, and you write uh, to your American and world audience, this is a very mining-centric country. But I'm noticing more and more... And the uh, major uh, publications of the states, it's now being brought up more and more. I actually heard them refer to the price of silver going from 4 to around 17 and change. So it's starting to creep into the consciousness. So that begs the question, when your fellow Americans realize, as you said earlier in this uh, broadcast, wake up to the fact that the dollar's not in very good shape and they're looking at down the barrel of a gun, and then the mania starts and everybody runs to the dealers, what happens next? Well, that's the euphoria start of the market, and I, no, I'm 99% sure that will take place. Mm-hmm. Of course, the question is when and where are we in the cycle right now. I don't see that really happening now until probably about the 2012 time frame, although obviously everything is set up where it could happen you know, tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's the case. I think we've got too many deflationary forces and recessionary concerns um, going forward for the next several months before we really get into... Uh, the optimistic phase of the market. I mean, and I think we're going to have probably a pretty strong first quarter for the metals, uh, and then we may have to back and fill again. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Gold actually, and very few really believe it, but gold does pretty good in deflation. In fact, actually does better than in inflation. So gold is the ultimate currency. Silver, as I've said before, has kind of a mixed uh, go at a true deflation. But we're in sort of a deflation of financial assets where the uh, stock market's coming down, but we're in a hyperinflationary mode in the credit system, which is all these loans that have gone through TARP and the Federal Reserve System. But that credit hasn't been turned into money yet, but it's being turned into money because what's happening is most of our major purchasers of the U.S. debt are pretty much fed up, and I, that's a deliberate pun. Right. They're fed up. <laughs> and so the only one that's left is for the Fed to come in and monetize the debt, and that, that is creating a bond or credit in the money. And that money, you know, does eventually work itself into the system. And you know, everyone knows the game. I mean, I'm not seeing anything here that yeah. the smartest people on Wall Street and the major banking system doesn't know as well or much better than I. And the problem is they don't have a solution either. I mean, I don't have, like, a solution. And the last thing they're going to do is give up control. They're not going to say, okay, well, the true price of gold is, you know, 10000 an ounce. Let's go back on a gold standard tomorrow. They're not going to do that. 
So it's going to unwind further as far as I can see. Dave Morgan joins us next. And Dave, from our last discussion, I know periodically for your subscribers, you sort of poll the different bullion dealers around the country. You take a look at who's offering the best price. And I asked you last week after we got off on the air, could you do that again and just take a look at different dealers around the country? Were they experiencing shortages? If they were, what kind of shortages? Because one of the things I've noticed in the last couple of weeks is the premiums on coins, especially like in Silver Eagles, have gone up substantially. So as you talk to these dealers, what were they telling you? Okay, I did a pretty good survey, as you outlined. I talked to two wholesalers, five of the largest retailers, Comex Depository, and one overseas bank that uh, works in the physical realm. So pretty well spread out. And the consensus is that there's really plenty of silver. Mike Maloney, for example, who uh, I think most of our listeners know with Robert Kiyosaki, he's written a book on gold and silver for the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series. He said that you know he deals primarily in silver eagles, and he said that it's a normal delay. In other words, it's a manufacturing issue, not a silver shortage issue, meaning that there might be, on a big order, they might have to wait a couple weeks to get them. I did have a call in to Tom Power, who is the, the principal at the Sunshine Mint, and he actually got back to me by text, but I didn't get to talk to him. I just wanted to see you know, what kind of runs they're making for the blanks, because they make the blanks for the mint. Regardless, from that aspect, they see no shortage. They just see, quote-unquote, normal delays because of high demand for the Eagles. And the reason that the premium has gone up is the mint sees the demand there, and so they're kind of... I guess they're taking advantage of it. I don't want to use that word really, but they're saying, but we're up in the uh, the premium on the Silver Eagles, and of course the dealers just pass that on to the public. The more interesting one of all, I think, was the Comex Depository. I spoke with John Potts of the Delaware Depository, and John had some interesting insights because I questioned everybody on you know as many aspects of the silver market as I could, and he said, you know, he sees ample supply everywhere across the board. I said, well, let's talk about the commercial side. He said, well, that gets a bit interesting. He said, there is a bit of a, I don't think he used the word shortage, but uh, a bottleneck. In the 9999 fine, four fines, silver bars. Now, this is a specialty product. Three nines fine is standard for a Comex bar. Anything that's three nines fine is allowed to be acceptable for Comex delivery. Four nines is used because of the high quality for your photovoltaics. And that's what's required to build these solar panels. Now, a lot of that silver at four nines fine goes over to China, made into photovoltaics, and comes back into the U.S. or wherever. Germany certainly is a lot of solar. And there is such a demand for these solar panels now. In fact, China has inc- doubled its solar panel production, I think, the last three years in a row. Whether they'll do it again this year or not, I don't know. But it's, you get the idea. The trend is significant. So there's a bit of a squeeze, you might say, in that one area of, um, of the commercial bar market. And there's only three refiners that are allowed to produce four nines fine, which is a, a subset of all the refiners that are allowed to produce bars for the Comex. One of the things I wanted you to look at, you wrote an article I think it was about a week or two on Kitco, and you were talking about Comex bars and the difference between the 399 bars and the 499 bars. And Dave Morgan was speaking with John Potts at Fidelitrade today, and he said there's a little bit of tightness on the 499 bars, and the reason is there's very strong demand for these bars coming from the photovoltaic industry, and especially China. I wonder if you might elaborate and comment on that, is this tightness still continue, and what does that mean for investors? Yeah, what we're seeing is there is some tightness for four nines and five nines purity silver bars, a thousand ounce bars, and as you said, it's primarily a reflection of the fact that you've had tremendous growth in silver demand for the photovoltaics, but also in some other electronic applications where fabricators want those bars and that purity. Let's suppose hypothetically that either a hedge fund or let's say somebody like Central Fund 
was to come in right now and issue, I don't know, another $300 million to come into the silver market, given the tightness that we're seeing in that particular type of bars, if they came in, Jeff, and I'm just thinking, if they were to come in with a market that's tight like this right now and start to buy, they would drive the price up, I suspect, number one. But number two, after they did all their buying, which drove the price up, the price would then come back down again. So I guess the question is, if I'm a sophisticated investor, would I want to do that, or would I rather wait to see a correction and things pull back? Yeah, well, there's a lot of information there. It, it's funny because, you know, first off, understand, let's take one step back from there. People are talking about, well, let's withdraw this silver from the COMEX and drive J.P. Morgan bankrupt and, and put a squeeze in the market. And you have seen some silver deregistered and come out of COMEX depository stocks are down about 3 million ounces in total since the beginning of the year, and registered stocks are off about 4 million. But if you analyze the data of who's been taking delivery, it's primarily institutional investors and banks and brokers. It's, there's some small investors who are buying it, but this is you know the decline that we've seen in COMEX stocks reflect industrial demand, and trading banks, these are not, the conspiracy to take delivery of COMEX is not working. Now, the second thing is, if somebody wanted to come in and buy $300 million worth of silver today, that would be about 9 million ounces of silver at today's price. And if they came into the market that I need 9 million ounces of physical supply delivered in two days, which is the industry standard procedure, they would, in fact, drive the price up. There is 9 million ounces of silver to be delivered especially if they want good delivery 3 nines purity. You, know, you have 41 million ounces of COMEX registered inventories. You have another 60 million ounces of eligible stocks at COMEX depositories. You have something like 570 million ounces in the ETFs, which all can be delivered in a day. So you know, if somebody came in and said, I want 9 million ounces of silver today, yeah, they could probably spike the price up to 35 or maybe even $40 but as soon as they're filled, and they would be filled, the price will come right back off. Uh, but to go over all the financial uh, news here with us is Max Kaiser, who's also the uh, inventor of the Hollywood Stock Exchange Virtual Trading System. He's a virtual specialist uh, technology inventor used on many of the stock exchanges worldwide, MaxKaiser.com. Max, b before you go any further, though, your rant that we linked up to Saturday on Infowars.com when you were on International RT, where you have a show but you were a guest, breaking down, and I'd seen this in the news, but billions and billions, uh, they say 7 to $10 billion of Gaddafi's money invested with the big banks, he even got some of the bailout money we now learn, has disappeared, and, and of course, they, they said no ground invasion. They said the bombs were love bombs and kinetic. Uh, now we know ground troops are there. Uh, so, so break down where the banksters are right now and uh, what they're up to. Well, it all goes back to, uh, yeah, by the way, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, it, all, it all goes back to uh, 2004, if you remember, Tony Blair was over in uh, Libya and making nice nice with Gaddafi and bring, welcoming him back to the world community and he was going to uh, dismantle his weapons of uh, terror and at that time Tony Blair was still the Prime Minister of uh, Britain uh, but he already had his eye on his post Prime Ministerial job which was to join the board of directors of J.P. Morgan which he now is part of J.P. Morgan he started that job on the second week after leaving number 10 Downing Street but back in 2004 when he's in Libya he's already basically setting the table for these banksters to come in like uh, Goldman Sachs and Society General who incidentally those two banks got huge bailout money during the 2008 bailout period so Tony Blair set the table, he set up the deals, and then when he left uh, his the job as Prime Minister of Britain... He went into the Morgan, revolving door. He starts to um, make introductions. And, uh, of course, Libya has this huge sovereign wealth fund that they accumulated being in the oil business. And Goldman Sachs swoops in there, and they say, yeah, we'll manage, we'll manage part of this business, a uh, billion dollar or more of the business. And they managed to blow through 98% of that account by just spinning the sovereign wealth fund as 
many of these banksters do when they get a hold of large chunks of money. So they engaged in weapons of mass financial destruction, and they t blew a billion dollars of that money. Uh, also, here in France, Societe Generale, uh, they got a hold of a billion dollars. They lost 75, 80 percent of that money churning and burning, uh, doing trades and engage, and at the same time getting bailout money from all the so they uh, made a deal that give them billions, and then they turn around and lose that money. Then they go into Libya and take that money, and they're all feeding themselves these huge bonuses. And so it's all Tony Blair's involved. The bankers are involved. The, their, the politics are, have merged with the banks, and they are this global establishment, this cartel that uses um, their influence to strong on their way into these economies. And I would imagine once they blow up Gaddafi, once they kill him, then of course they don't have to worry about any lawsuit. Uh, similarly, remember Saddam Hussein who started trading his oil in euros, they killed him. Uh, they don't like um, uh, the leader of Iran because he's talking about trading oil in euros. So of course he's been targeted for uh, some kind of action by military forces. So if you step out of line, uh, they will come in there and they will assassinate you. Uh, or they'll just come in there and start managing your money like they do for pension accounts all over America and Great Britain, losing billions and billions of dollars engaged in all their fraudulent trading. And it's all subsidized by the taxpayer. And any time they make a mistake, they strong arm the Congress, as was done in 2008, to give them billions and billions more of bailout money. So it's a mafia cartel. It's global. And Gaddafi is uh, the latest victim. Now, uh, Max, expanding on that, uh, we have the Senate uh, committee saying clearly Goldman Sachs lied again. Crimes have been committed. More subpoenas are going around. The problem is almost the entire Treasury uh, and federal government uh, at the management level, our former Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan or Bank of America or Wells Fargo uh, alumni, Citibank, uh, all of the usual suspects, the private Federal Reserve shareholders, and they've also put their people in over Greece, over Ireland, uh, over Iceland, over Portugal, and everywhere they have their people in, uh, they loot and steal everything. And we did learn uh, in Iceland, of course, you were there a few years before this happened at, at a bar with them, they were bragging to you that over 90% of the debt was not owed by the people, it was owed by the bankers. And so this is coup d'etat by bankers, world government by bankers, but more and more people are standing up to them. You're about to go to Greece. Tell us about the resistance to these people mounting worldwide. Well, you see, in Greece, there's a protest today, the biggest so far. I just got news from somebody who was at the protest who said the numbers are closer to 250,000 in Parliament Square, and they are identifying clearly the enemy uh, as the bankers, and the government has been involved in really an unbelievably uh, atrocious act of what many in Greece are now calling treason. Uh, when he came to power uh, going back in 2009, he immediately sold uh, a, a billion in credit default swaps to his friends uh, in, in uh, Credit Suisse, Swiss banks, and uh, other cronies in Greece. Within five months, uh, when the IMF came in and said, well, we're going to have to start rearranging the furniture here, uh, though that particular trade was worth $27 billion. And so he knowingly uh, put $20 billion or so uh, of profits into the pockets of his cronies. Um, and that's $20 billion, if it were on the books of Greece today, would pay down most of their debt problems. So that is an act of treason by the folks uh, in Greece who have identified Papadreos, the prime minister, as a treasonous rat that they need to get out of. They're fighting against the Troika. And it just came out today, Alex, that the advisors who are advising the Greek government now on the assets that need to be sold to pay the debt, and the debt, of course, was not originated in Greece. The, the debt was foisted on to the Greek people from outside, from the global banking cartel. Now, to settle the debt that the people themselves had nothing to do in, in incurring, uh, Deutsche Bank will get their state gambling monopoly. Credit Suisse will get the state lotteries. The Rothschilds and Barclays will get the road concessions. PricewaterhouseCooper will get the railway. France's BNP and Greece's National Bank are getting the airport concessions. And Lazard uh, are going to get the Greek trust and loan funds. So here you have a who's who of the global banksters. They're carving up the economy in Greece using the debt that was never there to begin with, that they just forced onto the people using inside cronyism with the private
prime minister involved, clearly, uh, to carve up the country and take those assets, and the country is, in effect, losing its sovereignty. And this is what we're seeing across Europe. And we're going to see it in the U.K., in the U.S., and North Africa, and uh, in the Mideast. This is the model. This is how people are losing their sovereignty. And it's happening in Greece is the roadmap. It's the model. That's it's right. Max, stay there. Happening. Max, we've got to go to break. We're going to come back. And, and, and this is on record. I saw a few months ago the head of the Irish Central Bank said, we, we don't owe this money, but we want the foreign banks to own and run us. Incredible. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds? I ended up for 30-something seconds talking to Max behind the scenes. Didn't even know I was uh, back on air there. Because I was busy during the break trying to find the BBC and Irish Times uh, headline where a few months ago the head of Ireland's central bank, a former Goldman Sachs guy, uh, said, we want Ireland to be run by foreign banks. Yes, we don't owe this money, but it's good to owe it. So, so this is too big to fail. Banks that did all this betting... And then they get governments to sign on. Then the governments come in and reduce the country's credit rating and say, now you've got to pay us, the people you just bailed out, even more money. Yes, you bail the banks out, then you pay them interest in taxes and carbon taxes. That's in Reuters today. But I did find this one, Irish Times. Ireland's future depends on breaking free from bailout. Remember, Ireland was this shining, wealthy example suddenly of Europe, and then overnight they sign on to the euro, they're imploded, they're in debt to the bankers. Max, you're an expert in this. I mean, how do you describe a fraud this overwhelming to people? The bankers, the, 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 this inner coterie of six global banks, they engage in mass fraud, and then they have all the government officials as their former alumni openly being paid off by them, and they sign you over. I mean, I saw in Greece where you're about to go, where hundreds of islands worth billions apiece that Greece has are being given in some cases to American hedge fund, uh, hedge fund owners as payment to them for fraud they created. I, I mean, this is like I rob a bank and I get a gold medal for it. I mean, this is insane, Max. Well, it's like uh, what we used to do on Wall Street, the leverage buyout or a hostile raid. You use the collateral of the company, or in this case, the country, as the, as the collateral for the loan that you use to take over the company or the country, then you sell off the component parts and you keep what's left as the profit. So this is, you know, Greece is only a $300 billion country, so it's not even as big as Walmart, one U.S. company. And that's why so they, they want to implode pennies. countries, because then they get to buy them up for pennies on the dollar. Right, and you mentioned it before, you know, the question is how, how does this all happen and why so, you know, has it gotten so out of hand? And you mentioned it earlier when you talked about repeal of Glass-Steagall, that in 97, that was a huge step in the, in the wrong direction. But then in 2000, at the very last few moments of Clinton's administration, you had the introduction of the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. And this allowed banks and, and fund managers to go from that, let's say, 10 to 1 ratio that you were talking about earlier to 30, 40, 50. 60 to 1 ratio. And so they were able to borrow. In the case of Greece, for example, it's a $300 billion economy, but the debts that are being made against Greece equate to 3 to $4 trillion in derivatives and credit default swaps. And there's no end to the negative bets that can be created because you just create them at the flick of a switch from nothing. They are, they're, they're just produced electronically. So no matter what the Greek people do to say that they're going to pay off whatever debts that they never incurred to begin with, the Wall Street will just create 10 times more of that in a negative bet and saying, oh, well, it doesn't really matter because, in fact, you owe us 10 times more. And then Moody's and S&P and Fitch, the so-called neutral credit rating agencies, who are also in on this basically cartel, this mafia, they are constantly downgrading the bonds of Greece. And, of course, this is making it impossible for them to get out from under this mafia control. So, the, yes, that is correct. They want to be able to buy islands. They want the airport. They want the lottery. They want the transportation. They want the infrastructure. For, and they don't want to pay more than a penny on the dollar for it. And it's a hostile raid coordinated by the government. George Papadreou, the prime minister, is involved in this. He's committing an act of tyranny, as described by the people there in Greece. 
as well as these fun and and John, uh, you know uh, Lloyd Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs, was in Greece just two years ago with John Paulson, who's one of the biggest hedge fund managers in the world. They had a meeting across from the Acropolis discussing at that time, and this has been recorded, how they would carve up the destruction of the country. And uh, John Paulson started making these incredible bets against Greece, just like he made those incredible bets against American housing, making those subprime bets that made him over a billion dollars in profits in one year, betting against American That's housing. That's right, because they... Using inside information that was passed to him from Goldman Sachs. That's why Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO, is facing possible perjury charges in front of Congress and the Department of Justice because he's lied about his relationship yeah. with the fund managers in passing inside information. And on that note, let me just make a quick uh, observation here. It's come out recently that senators and congressmen in Washington, this is really incredible, Alex, they are exempt from any insider trading law. You can look this up on Google. If you're a Washington senator or a congressman or a staff member, you can trade on inside information completely outside of any law that's supposed to prohibit that. You are exempt from any of those laws. So the people who manage money in those circles, they're constantly making 10, 20% more than the market because they're saying they're such astute money managers. But there's a direct pipeline. No, that's why people Washington get into Congress. That's why billionaires will, will pay $100 million to get into Congress because they can make another billion out of it. But, but let's stop there and explain something to people. The Democrats are saying give us more government, go into more debt because they're bought and paid for by the big mega banks. The Republicans are saying slash everything with austerity but not so we can get out of debt. No amount of slashing, and I've seen the numbers, would get anywhere near getting us out of debt. It's designed, so folks need to understand that. These Republicans saying austerity, privatization. Austerity and privatization means being gang raped by the offshore banks who control both parties and the leadership. Uh, there's the headline, insider trading rules that don't apply to Congress. Uh, we've got the Wall Street Journal uh, and uh, others. Uh, and Forbes. That's Forbes on screen for PrisonPlanet.tv viewers in case you're a new listener uh, or watching on PrisonPlanet.tv and, and, and think Max is making this stuff up uh, on screen. Forbes uh, right there in your face and that's from uh, June 1st just a few days ago. So this is the criminal takeover. It's why they're so arrogant. It's why they're setting up the police state here domestically because they don't want you to take your government back and prosecute them. So understand, you could cut everything. You could get rid of all entitlements. You're talking about less than a couple trillion a year max. They have created 1.5 quadrillion in derivatives. They've had their criminal agents and government worldwide, they put their people in everywhere, sign on to the debt. They tell you it's your debt, and now you have to give them all your infrastructure, raise your taxes, cut your Social Security, take your private pension funds, take the veterans' pension funds. It's all happening debt bondage. In closing, Max Kaiser, what do you make of the good news, though, with the robo-signing suits and all the rest of it, and Bank of America, CBS News, having one of the their branch bank seized. The deputies threatened to take the money out of the cash register, uh, out of the bank till, to pay the family that had their home that they never had a mortgage with Bank of America. They never had a mortgage. They paid cash. And Bank of America knew this, but still, all over the country and the world, banks are taking houses that they don't even own. I mean, this shows that the facade of these crooks in suits is imploding. Well, there's, there's another big side to that story. Uh, the side that you described, and I've been listening to the show and you've been talking about it, uh, the fact that uh, the banks have e illegally been foreclosing on folks, and that's after they illegally induced them to take on mortgages outside of the law to begin with. But there's another big side of the story, is that once they made these illegal mortgage loans, they packaged them and sold them to foreign investors and foreign banks as a securitized loan. And now the banks at these foreign banks are saying, wait a minute, you sold us a, a 20, 30, 50 billion dollar package of securitized loans, but we know reading the papers in the U.S. that those loan documents don't exist. So these, these securities that you sold us are invalid, and now they're trying to push those back to the U.S. government. And the U.S. government, as you also reported, are buying 98% of their own treasury bills, and they're buying some astronomical sum of their own treasury paper. Wait, because I thought it was 75. Don't want to buy U.S. paper I anymore. thought it was 75, Max. You're saying 98%? You're saying well, the number that you quoted earlier on the T-bill market was over, it was a 90%, over 90% on the T-bill yes. market. 
which is the very liquid paper that they are they're not buying anymore. That's not the But the issue here is they're, they're also, selling mortgages in these packages when they don't never even own the house. This isn't just they're selling bad loans. These I mean why shouldn't they though? If they're going to engage in all these crimes, Max, why not go all the way? Well, th this is why the, you know, you talk about austerity measures. In the United States, the poison on offer is not austerity. The poison on offer is inflation. And that's why in the U.S., the problem is the food and energy prices are skyrocketing because to pay for all the malfeasance, the government is creating more and more and more money, the things that Ron Paul talks about all the time. So the average American is having their food and energy prices go up in value. Absolutely, at the same Max. time, their house prices are falling in value. You're so right. Being squeezed on We're out of time, time. Max. MaxKaiser.com. I'm Alex Jones with InfoWars.com. See you back tomorrow, 11 a.m. Central. We'll have Max back later in the week if he can on the inflation bond. Um, that's how they're robbing you. They're crooks. Wake up. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want.